So um, we now have effective therapy for hereditary angioedema attacks, and I think one of the important things from the guidelines is that every patient needs to have an emergency plan uh, in case they have a severe or life-threatening attack. Um, the second sort of key point from the guidelines is that for patients who have had life-threatening attacks, who have frequent or disabling attacks, um, should be considered for prophylaxis to, to prevent attacks as opposed to just treating them. So patients um, with several of the therapies, both for um, prevention and treatment of acute attacks, can um, treat at home. Um, some, the C1 inhibitor products require IV infusion, which uh, can be achieved at home, but can be difficult for some patients. Um, uh, Acatabant can be self-administered subcutaneously at home, and then acalantide um, can be subcutaneously administered, but requires the presence of a healthcare professional. Uh, for many patients, there can be a visiting nurse who comes to the house to um, provide that oversight for administration. So one of the things that the guidelines uh, acknowledge is that pediatric patients um, are, are left out or, or poorly studied. Um, we think that every patient with identified hereditary angioedema needs to have an emergency plan, which may just um, be knowing the location of an emergency room where acute treatment is available. Um, the C1 inhibitor products are approved for adolescents and adults, which is 12 and up, um, and um, acalantide is approved for 16 and up. Um, uh, Acatabent only for 18 and up, although in the right circumstances I think we can consider adolescent patients for treatment off-label. Um, I think many experts feel that since C1 inhibitor um, is a natural product purified from blood, uh, it may be the most appropriate in pregnant patients um, because it's giving back something they already have. So I think the hardest question, the, the two hardest questions we have are which patients really require prophylaxis, which is typically very expensive given twice a week IV. Um, the guidelines are really expert opinion. There, there's really no um, uh, relevant studies. And so we really, I think, need to go back and take patients uh, and maybe randomize them or at least look in some sort of real world way at who really benefits from prophylaxis and who doesn't. Um, and the second is we really now have three treatments that are approved for acute uh, attacks, and we have no idea if one is better uh, than the other, or if there are different patient characteristics that would uh, um, predict who would respond to which therapies. Unfortunately, the trials were all done in subtly different ways with somewhat different endpoints, complete resolution, near complete resolution, substantial improvement, and so we can't really compare um, the endpoints of one trial to another. We know that all the products seem to work, um, and we have to um, sort of go back and maybe look either head to head or at least try to identify which patients respond best to which um, treatments. The one thing we do know is that um, treating early in attack seems to help with all the products and so we encourage patients uh, to really be ready to get treated either at home or at the doctor's office or an emergency room um, because if we can sort of prevent the attack from becoming severe uh, that's better than waiting till it's severe and then trying to treat. I think the big thing is um, who to put on prophylaxis and I, my personal opinion is that since there's no real uh, data that that's really an individual decision between each patient and whoever manages their HAE. Um, there may be some patients who uh, the guidelines would suggest should go on prophylaxis um, but who for whatever reason don't want to um, and I think we have to manage you know respect that preference and manage them as best we can um, but I also think there may be patients who the guidelines would suggest don't deserve prophylaxis who will benefit from it and I, I think we have to be careful um, not to sort of overstep uh, our knowledge and say that some patients aren't candidates for prophylaxis because once it's in a guideline that would suggest that the insurance companies may not pay for it even if it is an appropriate therapy for that patient.